if you look in the client server yesterday, uh, yesterday, right? So what basically it does that we have our client server now uh, has continuous uh, connection. So the client basically gets an input line from the user from the terminal, and then sends that line to the server. The server will reply back or resend back the same line back to the client and the client will basically display the same line on the screen right? we call this the echo server right? so this is what we were doing yesterday that the server basically will create will fork a new process a new child process for each incoming client connection right? for each client it connects a server a child process will be created will be forked by the server itself so one child process handles communication, socket communication with one client. Right. So the other problem was that once, uh, once a client terminates, the server would not know. Right. The first version we tried that the server would not know when a client has terminated. So and that leaves the child process as hanging or zombie process. Right. So we cannot allow this to continue because zombie processes are still residing in memory and they will take up extra space, right? So we need to remove them. So we did some kind of uh, signal handling yesterday, right? So we saw that we, we created a function signal handle, which will basically check for signals from terminating clients. So each time a client terminates, the signal handler will, will get a signal that a particular client has terminated and it will report the ID number of the client which has terminated back to the server. Right, you can see on the screen and at the same time it will remove the zombie process that was okay that was okay if, if you only have one client the thing was that when you have multiple clients connected to the server there are multiple child processes the problem was that the signal handler can only handle one terminating client at one time so the first client which was terminated was uh, captured but not the remaining ones we are using uh, the wait command. So we saw yesterday the wait command which we use as a signal handler can only handle one uh, terminating client. See by right it should be only one but somehow it, it captures more. But anyway the main thing is that it cannot capture all terminating clients. Right? Not all of them. So the next version we were trying is that we will use instead of use wait we will use uh, another function called wait PID right so the second one so the wait will only capture the first terminating client but the wait PID will capture all terminating clients so whichever client terminates all at the same time it will capture all of them right so in other words it would remove all zombies right? so once the client terminates all the child processes related to the particular uh, all the child processes created by the client has been captured right, by the uh, by the wait PID function is now a signal handler. So in other words, now no zombie processes are, are there. Uh, so this is a much much better version compared to the earlier. Right, so this is what we, do, we were doing earlier. Right? So main thing is that once the client client creates five connections, each connection goes to a, a child process, and then when the client terminates, it will send the fin packet. So this fin packet will go back, will be sent to the to the, the socket. The socket is connected to each child process, so they will go to the fin here. And then the fin will generate the sick child error, uh, sorry, uh, signal, right? And this will be the one which is captured by the server parent. So if you use if you use uh, earlier the wait command, it will with the wait function it will not capture all of them right so if you use the wait pid then it will capture all of them right so this one we saw yesterday so if you use the wait pid then it fetches all child processes which are terminating so this is the version we are using now right so basically it's, it's not much difference from what we have seen earlier our our server versions right so we open up open a socket uh, create an empty socket, fill the information, bind it, 
and start listening to it. The only thing we add is that we add a signal handler here, right, which is called a signal function, which we have seen earlier. And uh, then basically the same things. Huh? We, uh, we accept the function, accept incoming connections, and then we check for some errors. And then once the accept is OK, then we'll fork a child process for each of them and then close the respective uh, appropriate uh, sockets. And that's it. Right? So this is a much more efficient uh, version, right? So now we can create a, so we can create a child process for each client, and then if the client closes, the server will know, and it will capture the uh, the, the closing uh, client, and then it will, it will remove the child process from the memory. Right? So there's no zomb no more zombies left. Now you see what is this, what is the client doing? If you remember the diagram earlier, let me let me just draw a diagram. So we have client, we have the server, right? The clients send the data to the socket, uh, send the data to the server, right? server echo back to the client then there's a user user type in something right so the client first what the client does first is to wait for user to key in something correct once the user key in something that line will be sent over the socket to the server the server will immediately once you receive on the socket, it will, it will back, uh, write back the same data onto the socket, it reaches the client. And the client, once get it, it will display it. Right? So if we look at this particular sequence, now we look at it here. What is the client waiting, what is the client waiting for? What is the client waiting for? What is the server waiting for? Two questions. Client is waiting for who? Client is waiting for user, right? Client is waiting for user to key in something, right? The server is waiting for what? The server is waiting for the server is waiting for client to send send something to it, so that it will reply, right? So now, client is waiting for for the user to key in. So if I if I go back and key something here. It will be sent to the server, so it will reply back. Okay, fine. Now, let's say the, the client now again is waiting for the user to key in something. Now, what I do is I go and terminate the server, kill the server. So now, our server is dead. But look at the client. Does the client know the server is dead? No. Why? Why does the client do not know the server is dead? Yeah? Function what? Not sure. Huh? No, of course, no, no, no notification. Yes, that's right. Because uh, when when the server terminates, it does not send. It does not inform client. That's true. But uh, another thing. There's another thing. Why does, the, why does the client does not know that the server has died? Of course the client does not, uh, the server does not see it, uh, does not uh, inform the, the client. Normally it's not a job of the server to inform client. When server dies, server dies. Right? It's not, it's not a job because server is normally separate. Main thing is that because the client now is, what is the client waiting for? user right so the client's attention now is on the user the client is waiting for the user so in other words it's it's not keeping track of the server side right 
if you look back at the code, we should go look back at the code. Right, if you look at the code here, uh, if it, sh it should be in string, string one. So, this is the client version, right? Client is waiting to get a line from the user. It's using fcap s. It's waiting here for user to key in something. So, the user is, the client is running fcap s, which basically is a function to read the input from the terminal or from the keyboard. Nothing to do with the socket, right? If the client, if the server has died, the only way the server can inform client is by the socket. Now, because the socket is now, is half open or half closed. The client socket is still open, client side is open, but the server has somehow closed it, right? Because it's terminated it. But the client does not know because client is not looking at the socket now. It is looking at the, it's stuck here. It's waiting at the, FCAT S, which is basically waiting for a user's input. Right? So that's the main reason. Right? So, like, so let's go back here. So our server has terminated. Our client still doesn't know what happened. So when I key in something, so now I say, right? So the client sends data to the user. Now, what do you think will happen? So now the client will read the data from the user and send it to the socket. It will go here, right? What do you think will happen? System crash? No, right? That's what happens. You send data, but there's no reply. Of course, there's no reply because the server is down. But what, what error do you get? It says server, server terminated prematurely, right? Because there's some error checking in there. So what it basically is, it, it happens is that when the, server, when the client tries to write the data onto the server, the right end. In the code, you see the next, next function is right end. So when you use the right end, then it, it tries to write the socket. The socket is already closed on the other side. So then, that's when it realizes, uh oh, I cannot send anything on the socket because the socket is now closed because the server is terminated. Right? So the main problem with this is now is that that when the server dies, the client won't know. Client will only know when it tries to communicate with the server. When it tries to send something to the server, then it will realize, oh, server is not, not around. Before that, it won't know. Right? So this again is a major problem. Right? Okay, th there's another, another version here. Let's see. Okay, this is what we were talking about earlier, right? Right, so the server, server and client connection. Uh, so the skill, or we should be actually terminating the child process, not the server process. But never mind. Right, so we kill the server process. Nothing happens to the client. Once we key in something to the, onto the terminal, we try to send it. Then only the server will respond with a reset. Right, because now the server has shut down. Server is down. Therefore, the client is trying to make a connection to the server with a particular port number. Say port number 9877. I'm sending data to 9877. Server already died. The service at 9877 is no longer running. So the, serv so the server asks, what's up? The client sends data to 9877. Who, who, who are you talking to? There's no such thing as 9877. There's no service running. So he sends a reset. So I ask you to go and try again. So server response with RST reset because there's no process running on that particular socket now. Right. So client will get, so when a client, so clients send data and then after that the client will wait for the read line here. Right. Client wait for read line. So this was the one which is right. And this is read. So now the client will 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 do a read. After write, the the server will send a reset. When the client try to read, it will get the read line will give a value zero. That means it cannot cannot be read any. Does you cannot read any data from the socket anymore, right? So n is equal to zero. So which is unexpected. 
So in this case, the client will terminate with the error. Right, so the main problem is that the client is blocked on fget s while, when the fin arrives. Right, so in this case, earlier actually, when we terminate the child process, we th when we terminate the client, oh, sorry, when we terminate the server, so if server goes down, so if server goes down, it actually will send a fin packet onto the socket. Problem is that our client is busy waiting for the user to key in something. It's not checking the read on the socket, right? So that was the problem. Although the server is right, when the server goes down, it sends a, a fin packet, the finished packet, saying that it's terminating on the socket. But our client is busy waiting for the user. So it does not register that there is something coming, a signal is coming. Right? Like if you guys are very busy here, something happened, you won't realize. Right? Because you're, you're not listening to that. Right? So that was the major, major problem. There's another possibility of things happening. Right? So this is described here. So in this case, we have the connection is established, so three-way handshake, right? So clients run socket and then runs connect. The server runs socket, bind, listen, and then once the three-way handshake is done, the connection is established. Then before the accept is returned, right? Before the new socket is, 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 is created for the connection, suddenly client sends a reset. That means what happens is after the three-way handshake, client terminates straight away. Three-way handshake and then terminate. So straight away, no sorry, it's not terminate. Uh, somehow something goes wrong and the client sends a reset. Right? So now the server is a, is a bit will be, because servers now, before it, can, uh, before it gets, uh, the accept is fully completed, if it receives a reset, that means now something is not, it's, it's something unusual. You're supposed to expect data coming in, but now you get a reset. Right. So this kind of errors, so there'll be two types, of, two, uh, two types of error will be reported by the server. Right. One will be the protocol error, right? Because now it has been, the, the connection has been established and suddenly it is reset. So now that means the socket is no longer connected. Right, so you will get a protocol error, and the other one you will get uh, connection connection ab uh, connection aborted. Right, that means the reset is basically abort the connection reset. So this, these two errors will be reported to the server. Itself. Remember when the connection comes in, you will have. The server coming in, then the server will fork, and this will become the child process, and the listening port will be here. Right? So, so basically, the client is communicating with the child process. So now we kill the child process. So the server is still running. The, so the thing is that in this particular case, the only, the only way we can know that something is going wrong is that once we send something to the server. Right? So one solution is that, how do we check this? So one solution given here will be that we do the write twice. So instead of this one, normally we get the data from the uh, user and then we write the same data into the socket using one function, right? Once we send them, and then if this thing is gone, it's terminated, then we'll get an error. So one option is that before we send the actual data, we send a simple one character, right? So we, we send the socket just one character first, and then wait for one second and see what happens. If if the child process is already dead, when you do the first write, you al already get an error here. So you don't have to write the whole thing. No point writing the whole data, sending the data when the socket is already uh, disconnected. Right? Then you write the remainder. 
right? So this is what it does. So it tries to write twice. Right? So after sending one, it tries to send one, one byte, and then it fails there. It doesn't work at all, right? Somehow the error is not captured in this particular iMac version, right? So in other words, by this means it, it does not send the full thing. You just try send one piece of data here, and then if that one fails, it does not continue anymore. So it sends here. Last time we just use, just used only one write. Now we use break them up. First time we send one character. If this is successful, then you go through the next one. Otherwise, will, the program will just stop here. Right? So we can try to do, do it this way. Not very good solution, but it helps a bit. All right. Other possibilities? Server, server failures, right? So, first one is that let's say the server crashes, right? Server crash means the whole, the whole thing, uh, that the whole application has been is down, right? So of course the client will not be notified, normally. Right? So what happens is the client will again will block on read line. Right, so waiting for it. So the client will basically will be waiting here, right? We send something, but there's no client responding because the client is down. Right? The client can continue transmitting data and waiting for acknowledgement, and then it will, it will try. So the way the TCP works is that it will try twelve times. First time try, wait for wait for a few minutes, doesn't work. Try again, right? So the TCP standard is that it will try 12 times and then about nine, after 9 minutes of waiting, then the client gives up and say that, okay, server not found or server is not responded. Then it will report errors time out. That means try sending data multiple times and then but no response. Right? Or it will say host unreachable or network unreachable. Right? So this is server crashes. Second version is that a server crash and reboot. Right? Server crash means basically it's, it's no, longer, uh, no longer working. The whole machine is down. Right? There's not, so there, there's no response at all. That's why, that's why the, the client will not get any response because the whole machine is down. Here, the server crashes and reboots. Okay? So it starts up again. When it starts up again, it means that the, the server process might not run. So the machines crashes, start again, but the server process is not restarted because that is normally required by manual, manual restart. And somebody needs to go and type in the command and then run it. Right? So now, the, the server process is not running. So client is not notified, of course. The client sends data, again waiting for the echo, nothing happens. But now, the client, so client sends data, nothing happens, but the server now will respond with a reset. Because now the server is running, the machine is running, but there is no service running on the particular port number. Right? So in this case, it will be something like this. So the first, so first version that the server goes down. Right? Server goes down. The client sends the data, and then it keeps is reading, is is doing now a read, trying to get a read, read something from there. Server down means, of course, it's down. It's not, it's not, it's not uh, alive anymore, right? So, server of course will not respond to anything because it is down, right? Second version is that now the server reboot, uh, it crashes and then reboots. It reboots means, reboots means there is no sockets anymore. Whatever sockets created earlier were destroyed. So there's no service running on a particular port because they were not restarted. So when the, when the server gets data coming in at a, at a particular port, say port 9877, it will check the server says, I did not open the 9877 port. I'm not expecting any traffic on a 9877. I did not open a 9877 socket. Right? So I don't recognize the client. Then I send a reset. Must be a mistake, right? It's, it's not me you're talking about. Must be somebody else. So that's what it means. 
right? So the server basically responds with the reset. So because the server has, has lost all the information of the sockets after crashing. So now, so when the client is basically is waiting for the data to come from the server, it's blocked there on read line. So the client is blocked on read line when the RST is received. So in this case, it will be the error of uh, connection reset. So once you get a re reset means, it means the client will inform that the server is resetting whatever socket. Third type is now the server is shutting down. Now the server is shutting down means it will try to inform all the clients. Just like I say, if you're running a, uh, just like if you're running, uh, for example, no, not, not this machine, if you're running, you log in as a terminal, right? Let's say you run, log in as a terminal and then the, the system admin shut down the whole machine. So that means users are normally given, say, a few minutes, uh, you better back up your data or close all the windows because the system is going down. Normally there will be a message. Right? So the signals will be generated and sent to all clients. Right? So that's the proper way. So if it's, if it's, if it's a shutdown, a proper shutdown, then there should be, the server should inform all the terminals which are connected to it by, by basically by signals. And the users must be, <coughs> must listen to their particular signals. Right? So that means the user must be on the same machine. If they're on different machines, then they won't get the signals. Right? So the users logged in on the same machine, terminal mode, you can be able to get a, uh, a this particular signal. Right? So what you should try this afterwards is the same thing. Right? OK, let's uh, finish it off. Right? OK, so now let's, uh, this is basically a summary of what the, the client, the connections between the client and server. So this is from looking from the client point of view. Right? So client will, open, will run a socket function, and then we run a connect function. Once you run, run a connect function, there are two things to be done right, before this. So once you do a connect, it will try to establish connection with the server. Right. So what the TP, TCP will do, we will normally we added, we will inform the TCP what is our, uh, oh sorry, this is the client side. So the client side, when we try to connect, we need to know the server's IP address, and we need to, we need to know the server's port number before we connect. I mean, put it into the socket structure normally. So the port address is for the TCP layer, the IP address is for the IP layer. And on the client side, the IP number and the port number is normally default. The port number is normally chosen by TCP as a, as a, as a, as a dynamic number. Right? And the IP number will be chosen by the router, whichever is given to you. On the server side, Again, same thing, when you start the server, we, we, we create a socket, we bind. When we bind, then we, we identify the socket's TCP uh, layer, what are the port number which we will be using. The IP number for the server, again, we will not specify, we will take whatever default is given by the router. Right. For the client side, so for the server, the, when he accepts the, the connection from the client, then it can obtain the port number and the IP address of the client from the socket structure itself. Right? We saw that earlier. There's a function to do that. Right? So, so each one will come from a different layer. That's what it's, it's trying to do. So the port number and the IP number will be returned, will be captured by the accept in the socket structure, which, can, which the server now can display to the screen. All right. The last part, let's look at this, how the server and communicate. So earlier our server and client is basically very simple. The server basically replies, echoes back the same data to the client. No processing done. Right? So this example basically shows you that the server, what it can do is try to do a little bit more actual, actual processing. So what the server will do is that it will try to add two numbers and then return the value to the client. Right? So this is so we are passing, passing text strings from the server side. Right? So again, the string echo function in the server is still the same. What we're going to do is that now, again, we read the socket, which is connected to the, to the client. And then once we read the socket and get the data into, into a, a buffer, which is called line, what we do is now we, now we scan the buffer, the line, 
you check for two numbers. LD is basically a large number, a uh, decimal uh, digit, large digit. Right? So we check for two of them. And once we get two, we will store into these two variables, long integers. And we check, we, when we scan that, we must get exactly two numbers. If, do, if the client does not supply two numbers, then something wrong. Then you, we basically we will not accept it. Right? So the client is supposed to supply two numbers. So the, the, server, the server reads the two numbers, put into different uh, variables. And then what it does, it will, it will uh, calculate the total of it, add them up, and then put, put them into, into the same line again. Right? It will basically uh, print, uh, try to format the total, right? add them up, and then uh, put them into the same buffer. And then write, 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 write back to the socket, which then means reply it back to the, uh, to the client, the new contents of it. So what it does is take two numbers, accept, read two numbers from the socket, right? read the data from the socket, put it into a buffer, scan the buffer for two numbers, add them up, take the result, put it into a buffer, and then send the buffer to the socket, which will go to the client. That's what it's doing. So here we are sending the data as, the client is sending data as uh, strings. Right. So this is one way. The other way is that we can send data between the client and server in a binary structure. In a binary structure means then we have to define a, a structure. Yeah. So instead of sending data as string, we are going to send data as now, as a structure. So we create a structure, it must be fixed. So we create a structure called arguments, and then there's also a structure called results. So again, this is on the server side, this is on the client side. So client sends two binary numbers. So first it gets the data from the user, right? This is where, uh, this is the client side. Yes, client side will get the two numbers scan the line, no, sorry, sorry, get the line from the user, read the line from the user, scan the line for two numbers, two numbers, and then put them into the structure, put them into here and here, right? If it's not two numbers, then say it's invalid input. After that, now what we are sending to the socket is not the buffer, but we are sending the structure itself. Right? So we're sending this particular structure. This structure contains the two numbers, the two integers which we have so stored as a structure and we send to the buffer. After that, we wait for the result to come from the server. And when we read the socket, we're also reading the structure. And the result structure is basically the same as, the, as defined here. Right? So we read the structure, then we can display the, the contents of the structure, which is basically the, it should be the value, uh, the, the, the sum of the two, two numbers which, which, which the server has sent. Uh, this is on the client side. On the server side, same thing, the server must also declare the same structure now. So the client and the server must use the same structure type. Right? So server here, basically just same thing, Read the read the uh, read the socket for the structure, right? And then once you get the structure, the data the two numbers will be in the structure. Then you basically calculate the sum, argument one plus argument two, put into the sum into a new sum structure, and then send the structure to the to the socket, right? If they are on the same machine, so now there is a, so there there is a, some some possible conflict in this, in this particular way of doing things. Now, if the client and server on the same machines of same architecture, now remember you are sending numbers and numbers supposed to be added, added up and then on the server and then sent back. Right? So the thing is that if you're on the same architecture, then it's normally no problem. 
mainly because the numbers are stored the same way. Right? But if the client and server are on different machines of different architecture, right, for example, one is iMac, the other is Windows or Unix, right, or some other, uh, other uh, type, then there's a possibility that the result you get may not be the same as the two numbers. Right? Because the numbers are stored in different ways in the, in, in the, in the memory. It could use a different different format. Right? One could use say uh, uh, 32 bit, the other use 16 bit. So there are few possibilities. So we send binary integers in sockets, binary integers. And so the problems are potential problems are basically the, the binary numbers might be stored in different formats. It could be little indeed on one side, big indeed on the other side. Right? Or it could be the the data type is defined differently. A long integer could be 32 bits on one side or 64 bits on the other side. So the client, client server might be interpreted differently, the same data. Or again, the way it, it creates a structure, the elements might be packed differently. Right? So again, there's a possibility of something going wrong. So the general rule is that if you want to send numbers, which needs to be processed between client and server, it's better to send as strings. Don't send as integers or don't send as structures because there's a possibility of them having different formats from one client and server if they are on different machines especially. If there's the same type of machines then it wouldn't be a problem. Right? But if you still want to use binary numbers or, or structures then it's best is to ex explicitly define the actual number of bits you're going to use. You're going to use 32 bits, make sure the other side also uses 32 bits. And then if you use, make, you use little endian, okay, make sure that you enforce that the other side also uses little endian. Right? Okay, so these are some of the things you, you need to try. Now, the, all these things you can try, no problem, right? I think, uh, so what you should do is look at the code, right? Look at the code of the server and client version of that. Run them on different, on different terminals, different screens. And then get output and then understand what is, what is happening and why is it happening that way. So this is no problem. The problem comes somewhere here. Now this, here the TCP client version 1 is not the same version as this, right? It uses string client, it uses a different library function. Let me just show you what I mean, and then I'll show you how to do it. So if you go back first one, you will see that when you first created the, so this is the echo version, right? So you have a string echo. So you, so you see our, our, our server, Okay, our server uses, this is server, right? In this particular uh, C program. The server uses string echo, line 21, right? This line, to, where is string echo? String echo is defined in, in, library, in, in, lib, in library uh, lib directory. There's a function file called string echo.c. So the string echo function is defined in string echo.c, right? Same thing for the client. We use the client version, client, TCP client version 01, which is in this directory. It uses string client function, line 15. String client function is defined in, again, in, in directory library, string client.c, and the string client function is defined. Right? Okay, this is fine. But one, once we come later, we will see that some of them will start using a different version of string client. Now here. Here it uses the string client version, it uses the same, same name, string client, the, the function name is same, except it is defined, the library function, this, this function now is defined somewhere else, it's string client version 11.c. But it's not the whole program. Right? 
So it's not a whole program. I'm not sure if you follow. OK, let's, let's look at this way. So this is TCP client 01.c, right? The client calls the client calls string client function. Where is this? It's not in the main program here. It is actually in Right, so this function is defined in this file. This is okay because when we, th they will know that this is a library is a standard library anyway. Right, so it, when you when you make this file, it will know where to find this function because the library is normally a standard place to put all those functions. Right, now the problem comes that if you want to replace, you don't want to use string client, you want to use. Eleven. Ah uh, no. no. Okay, sorry. The main thing is that now I don't want to use this library function. In the main program, still the same, except that now I want to use So now I want to use, in the main program, I still use call string client, still the same function. But the function now I want to use string client is the, is the version which is defined or stored in here. I don't want to call a library function. That's why it's trying to use. So in the main program, it's still the same. The, 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 the TCP client is still the same thing, except that now you're using a different version of string client, which is defined inside here. Right? So now we need to somehow do this, uh, compile in different ways. So look at this. So when I say this exercise here, so that means this particular client server, uh, the client version 01, it just not, does not use a default string client. The default one is this, which is okay, but it uses a variation of it. And the new string client, we should use the one which is here, as given an example in the book. So now we need to compile this program to make it use this function, right? Okay, that's what I'm going to show you now. Okay. Okay. Now uh, look look at look at this carefully. It might be confusing, but you have no choice. Okay. So what I need to do is, let's take an example. Which one we going to do? Okay, let's use this. Huh? Uh, this one, we use, we use this function, this example. We're going to use this. So the server is still the same. The client, we need to change it to use the, the, the string client function, which is defined in string client 11.c. So what we need to do is first open the open string client zero one. I'm going to find where's my string client. Op, uh, no, TCP client zero one. This one, right? Okay. Don't do yet. I just see first. So here, this is, a, this is a full program, right? There's a main program and all that. There's no problem. So it uses called string client. Except that this string client now will be actually be, is from the library. But we want to use a different version. So what we do is now we want to use the string client 11.c here. We want to use this function. Oops. Uh, not this one, not this one, not this one. String client, ah, okay, string client 11, okay. 
open string client dot c eleven eleven dot c you get this, right? There's no main program here. It's just a function only. So what you do? What we do is just copy. Copy the function. This one. Uh, copy. Copy this function and then put into. Oh, I should open the other one. Put it into the main one, the TCP client. Yeah. And then paste. Right. Right. So we open the, the main one, TCP client 01, and then because we want to use this string client from a different version, take wherever it is, which file it is, it was in this file, and then paste it here. Right? And then save. Save. Then what you do is you're going to make string client function. Next time you use another function, next time you're going to use string client with a different string client version. See here, this is 0, 11, this is 9. Okay, then take out the 9 from there and then replace it with, with 0, 9. Right, so then what I, do, what I do is that I go here, I remove this one. And then I go and find string client 09 version. So this is 09 version. I take on this and put it there and then make again. Right? So this is how to run the different versions. If you look, if you go in into your um, I have put these instructions on the Moodle, on the e-learning to help you do this, um, let me show you where it is. So if you log in to your Moodle, you will see here, this one. Guidelines to call alternative library function from a client server main program. So this is a PDF file, you can download it and then it follows the instructions one by one. It's basically the same steps I've shown you, right? Maybe I should download this. So it's something like this, right? I, I color coded it, so it, it helps you with that. Okay, so that, that's what you're supposed to do. The only thing is that that means your old version of TCP client 01 will be overwritten with the new ones. So if you want to keep, keep a copy, make, make, go to your directory and then make, make a copy of the old file, call it something else, original. Right, so I'll give an instruction in there earlier. All right, so download this one, then you, you try to follow uh, Try to follow these particular instructions and then for one of them. Okay, so try these exercises one by one, try to understand and then uh, let me know if you have a problem.